like whether you can see us, but maybe Lander, if you want to say a hello too, so that your face can pop up and people know who you are. Yeah. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm going to start with uh, Land and I prepared a, a PowerPoint presentation just for some, some images and visuals. So I'm going to share my screen now and get that going. Um, so here we are. Can everyone see that? Awesome. Yeah, so the, the topic that, well, Liza invited us to, to speak about um, was e ecological relationships. And I, um, I consider myself a storyteller, and I know that, that Lander does too. <laughs> and so I tend to think of things as stories. And in our you know, ecological relationships, that sort of viewpoint of interacting with the, the bigger, wider world, I like to think of it as learning stories. Um, and so that was where the sort of stories of the land came from. So we're going to be talking a little bit more about our connections with the, with the landscape. Um, and how we facilitate that for ourselves and for children within the programs that we run. So this just gives a, a little bit of an overview of what we're, we're offering to people today uh, to reflect on our connections to places where we live and work and how we can help foster that for children too. Uh, considering relationships and reciprocity. So just doing a little bit of a, a deeper dive into those concepts and what that means for us. And then also presenting some ideas for learning with and from our ecological communities. Um, I often hear the phrase, you know, learning in the outdoors, and we're trying to reframe it for ourselves as with and from. So it's more of a, a relationship um, way of thinking as opposed to a, you know, just a, a location that's external to ourselves. So, um, but before we go into that, I thought it would be nice to, and actually I've lost the chat box now, so <laughs> I can't see you, but I was going to just offer us a moment of gratitude. Um, it's something that I often enjoy starting events like this off with, just to, to have a moment to kind of all come together and think about uh, what we feel grateful for, because uh, especially at this time, there's a lot going on and a lot of unknowns, and sometimes it can just help to feel, us, uh, to feel a little bit more settled. Um, so I just wanted to offer a chance if you have something that you're feeling grateful for and want to put it in the chat. I can't read it, so I don't know, Liza, if, you, if things pop up, maybe you can just shout it out so that we can share sure. in that. Um, I'm feeling particularly grateful for the sunshine today, and I took myself out for a walk in um, an area near me called the Green Belt, where I can go for, for some longer walks, and the wildflowers are coming out, and it's just, oh, it's my favorite time of year to see the wildflowers. So for me, that was a, a really special way to uh, spend the day before coming here and sitting in front of a screen with all of you. <laughs> um, Lander, did you, not to put you on the spot, but I wondered if you had a gratitude to, to share. Yeah, I can share um, gratitude for my garden. I have a a little yard for the first time. It's the first time I'm kind of settled after moving around for a long time and I have a garden and I'm growing all sorts of amazing food and, and eating out of it every day. So I'm very grateful to have that, to go and visit in between my work from home and then to eat from it at nighttime. Fantastic. And Kathy, who's in Arizona, is grateful for the sunshine also. And we've been finding lady slippers in our um, nearby woods, which is so fun and beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. Is there more, Liza? Uh, Do yeah, Donna was saying birds singing, butterflies, and insects visiting their plants. Anne says grateful for the ocean. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you, everyone, for sharing. If more comes to mind, feel free to add it to the, to the chat. Um, so just wanted to, before we launch into our, um, our own stories and ideas and thoughts that we want to share with you today, I just wanted to currently acknowledge that I am living in Ottawa in Canada right now after leaving um, Antioch. I moved last, last June, actually one year ago yesterday, <laughs> to, yeah, to, to Ottawa, Canada, and that is the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. And so it's important to me and in, in my work uh, connecting people to the natural world to learn the stories of the land where I live, and that includes those of Indigenous people. 
um, of the area. And so I aim to make space for Indigenous perspectives in my work. And this has also definitely influenced my, my thinking and what we're going to be sharing with you today. So it's uh, important to note that what we're offering around these perspectives and ecological relationships, this isn't new information that Lander and I have made up. <laughs> um, but I'm also, you know, we're not offering it from an Indigenous perspective either because that's not ours to share as settlers on this land. Um, so what we're sharing with you today is, is more of that it's the relationships with Indigenous people and what we've learned from them and how it's influenced our thinking. And we encourage other people to learn more about perspectives and, and integrate that in their work too. Lander, did you want to speak to this at all for your area? I think just to say that um, I live in what is now considered Maine and um, Maine along with parts of Canada and New Hampshire is the traditional and unceded territory of the Wabanaki people or the people of the Dawnland and right on the peninsula where I live it's specifically Penobscot and Passamaquoddy. Great, thanks Lander. And I also, this is a quote that I just came across the other day actually through an organization um, called Future Ancestors. And they were posting it as something that they're doing because of the nature of how we're gathering together these days. We're all in our different places. So territory acknowledgements have become more common um, over the years and particularly in Canada and doing them in a way that's respectful when we're on devices and separated across different spaces is challenging. And so this is a way that Future Ancestors is presenting territory acknowledgements. Um, and I just, it made me stop and think, which is why I'm, I'm offering it today. Um, so if you aren't immediately asking questions upon your arrival or of your ancestors' arrival on the land you are on and about your role, history, and relationships to that land, then there needs to be some questions asked as about how we perpetuate contemporary colonial erasure and violence. So pretty powerful and you know hard thing to, to hear um, or to read, but it's something to just ponder and, and reflect on. And I highly recommend looking into Future, Future Ancestors as an organization. I think they're, um, or actually a social enterprise. I think they're doing some incredible things. And also if you would like to learn more about the, the indigenous um, people where you live, nativeland.ca, there's a link there, is a fantastic resource. Um, as you can see, the, the map comes from, from that website. And it's, it's really gathering a lot of information together for people to learn more. So that's a, a resource for people if you would like to access it. So, um, that's not what I wanted, that's what I wanted. <laughs> so um, in thinking about our ecological relationships, I actually wanted to start with a, a little story of a place where Lander and I worked in New Hampshire. This is not too far from Antioch. Um, those of you who are near Antioch may recognize it. <laughs> This is um, a school that we worked at through our, our program tracks and we delivered an after school program uh, for about a year, a little over a year. And I just, we, we launched the program in March of 2018 and I wasn't familiar with the, the place at all. I was relatively new to New Hampshire having just moved there in 2017. Um, I didn't know the lands. I didn't even know <laughs> really the trees. <laughs> I'm really glad I had Lander with me because I'd come from England. So Lander was more familiar with the New England flora and fauna, uh, which was so helpful. I didn't know what poison ivy looked like. <laughs> um, so we were a good team. But as we, as we spent our time delivering this program, we started to learn more and more and more. So we started the program in March and then it, it turned from winter to spring. And I'm gonna, I don't know if you can see my arrow. Can you see that? The cursor? You can? Okay, fantastic. So I'm just gonna kind of point out some features. So this is the school and we used to take the kids, we would leave the school and we would walk down um, the grass fields. And then there was a place where we could enter into this forested area just here. And we had a little circle of seating and a, like a fire pit. So we would gather here, somewhere around here every day. And that would be sort of our home base. And then we would explore further afield. And so when we first started the program, we got to know the trees in this immediate area here around our base. And it was mainly white pine. So those became the, the familiar tree straight away. And they actually, there were a couple white pines that just had phenomenal branches for climbing. They became the favorite trees for climbing and also building forts. And so that was sort of our first initial connection was to the white pine. 
Um, we gathered some of the needles because we learned that they were edible and you could make teas. And so we would um, boil water over the fire and then make tea. So that built our, our connection to the white pine. We also had, there was one little solitary paper birch tree <laughs> that I actually used as one of the boundary markers when we first initially got there. Um, and that was something that was special to us. And we would sometimes um, use some of the, the, the bark to light our fires as well. So that became an, another connection to, to a tree in that area. Um, and as we got, as the, the weather warmed up and we moved into spring, we started to explore down in this area. I wish you could see it better, but there's a stream, really, really beautiful um, stream that had such amazing things to discover. So we would leave our little base area and we would walk down to the, to the stream. And we started to notice even more things that were happening there. Um, we found red trillium. That was uh, the first time I'd ever seen that. And that was stunning and everyone was so excited. That was somewhere, I think somewhere around here. Um, we also found a ton of salamanders and frogs. And so that became our, you know, adventures of, of catching the salamanders in yogurt containers and looking at them and learning about them. Um, as we sort of moved into the summer season, we also discovered somewhere, I think around here, a ton of Japanese knotweed. So we watched that as it emerged and it's such a dinosaur looking <laughs> plant. Um, so we noticed, noticed that was there. Um, we also discovered as we explored a little bit further, I think it was around here as we were kind of exploring and finding a new path back up to our base area, a huge patch of poison ivy. And we almost noticed it too late. And I actually had like a rescue mission where I was transferring children from one rock to another over the poison ivy patch <laughs> so we could get through. So that was a, a discovery. Um, and then we had a break for the summer, for the, the uh, summer break. And then when we came back in the autumn, we started to discover even more things. So just around, this again was our base camp and just nearby, um, one of the children really excitedly found a puffball mushroom. You know those mushrooms that you can touch and then they poof um, the spores into the air. And so that was super exciting. And we found a patch of those just somewhere. I think it was somewhere around here. Um, and obviously the, you know, the leaves were turning and there were some beech trees that were incredible colors turning yellows. Um, and that was, yeah, phenomenal for us to experience that. And then as we moved into, um, winter and all the, the plants and vegetation started to die back, we were able to explore this area up here, which was um, a cattail, sort of a, a wet marshy area. And we found a deer skull in there. And that was a you know, spectacular day of discovery. And we realized that there definitely was deer around there too. When the snow fell, one day as we were walking along just behind the base camp, we found the print and scat of what we later discovered was a bobcat. So that showed us, you know, bobcat was in the area as well. Um, and then as we again started moving towards spring, we were able to do some tree tapping uh, or, or sap uh, tapping from a maple tree, which we, there was one just by the parking lot of the school. Um, that was a special tree that we, we got to tap some, some sap from, and then we attempted to make maple syrup, but you know, anyone who's tried <laughs> knows what that's like. We made a, a maple drink that we boiled over the fire. So that was kind of a yearly cycle of us exploring this, this space and getting to know it and building a relationship with it. So it got me to think about, having trouble, there we go how we, or at least how I viewed my ecological relationships over time in my life. And this is actually something I've just, I've recently put up a blog post on, on Forest School where I talk more about the consideration of ecological relationships impact and also this notion of reciprocity in outdoor programs. And this is a diagram that I created to represent what I sort of visualized as my journey in coming to understand my ecological relationships over time. And just noticing that the culture that we live in tends to sort of view the natural world as with the assumption that it's, yeah, we can use it for learning and play. And there might be some consideration for impact, but it's just this automatic assumption of it's there for us to use as we wish. And as I became more connected with particular places, that started to shift for me. And it moved more towards a, you know, mitigation and sustainability perspective where I had an increased awareness of my impact because I was there, you know, at least one day a week, if not more. And so 
I was able to really see that impact a lot more and give greater consideration to how to, how to mitigate the negative impacts and work towards this idea of sustainability. But in the past few years, it, I feel like it's, it's also shifted and changed where particularly as I've learned more about indigenous perspectives on relationships with the natural world, it's this idea, uh, I'm moving towards this idea of relationship and re reciprocity, which is understanding ourselves as engaging in a relationship with the land, and that's deserving of mutual respect and reciprocity. And we're going to talk a little bit more about what, what reciprocity means to us and what it can mean for you a little bit later. Um, but this is a linear journey. <laughs> And when I stopped to think about it, I was like, well, that was sort of in my career and in my work with children in the outdoors. This is how I view myself. But what about before I started, you know, as an educator? And I started to think about my relationships with the natural world when I was a child. And I realized that this linear model wasn't the full picture. And that actually, it looked more like this, where I had started as a child caring about the natural world, knowing that, you know, when I um, touched a gecko, I grew up in Hawaii, the tail would fall off and uh, that, you know, there was birds that had been abandoned by their mother and I scooped up and took them home in a box and cried when they didn't survive, <laughs> you know, because I felt a responsibility to look after them. And so I had interactions with the natural world where I, I knew it was reciprocal and I knew that there was um, a back and forth. And it was socialized out of me. Um, you know, I was made fun of when I cried that the birds died because they're just birds. Why do you care so much? Um, and so thinking about this in our work with children, I think for me has been really powerful of what are we, what are children innately coming to us with in their perspectives of their relationships with the natural world? And how are we influencing that by either supporting it or, you know, not supporting it? So just a little food for thought in my own journey. I don't know if it matches others, it, it may not, but those are a few thoughts. Um, so in thinking about this, you know, relationships, we've titled this presentation, ecological relationships. So what does this word mean? And over time I've come to, to um, come up with, I guess my own definition of what relationship building consists of and that's for me three things and that includes time so to build a relationship with something we need time to get to know one another proximity so being near one each other um, or near one another and then also this piece about reciprocity so in engaging in a give and take and there's a question that i'm posing there because this is another thing that i've you know been learning about over the the years, um, this idea of do we take and then give, or do we give and then take? So just a, a question there. Um, and I think, yeah, we just wanted to highlight in this, this reciprocity piece, because we often, I hear a lot and I even, you know, do it without, if I don't catch myself in my own programs, thinking about what can nature provide for us? You know, what are the activities, the enjoyment, the relief, all of that what, that we can get from the natural world. But more and more, I've been asking myself, what can I do for it? Um, and, and doing that first. So what can I give before I take? And that's a, that's a shift in mindset because it's not something that I think is um, widespread in the culture I live in anyway. <laughs> And just to uh, illustrate this reciprocity, <laughs> I wanted to share a video because I, like I mentioned, moved to, to Ottawa last June and started to do some exploring and going for walks. And there's a, a few trails near where I live. And because I was new to the area, I didn't really know what was around. And I discovered on one of my walks, a, a boardwalk that goes up to a viewing platform over a pond. Um, really, really beautiful location. But I didn't realize that if I had carried on, I came at it from one direction. And if I had carried on down the path a little bit further, there's actually um, like a bird rehabilitation or, or, or a sanctuary where people learn about and, and support and help birds. And so there's a lot of visitors who come through from that direction and they actually get bird seed and come to this boardwalk and feed the birds and the squirrels and, you know, the animals that are there. 
I had no idea that the animals there were, were used to this. And so when I walked up, just expecting to be able to be on a boardwalk, look at the plants and the trees and maybe see some birds and um, whatever is on the pond, I was instead greeted by birds flying straight <laughs> up to me <laughs> and squirrels running over as if they were like when you have a pet and you come home <laughs> and they're so eager to see you like, yeah, it's dinner time, feed me <laughs> or I've missed you. That was the response that I got from these wild birds and squirrels. Um, and it just shocked me. I, I honestly, I felt like Snow White. I was just like, ah, these birds flew to me. Um, and I just have a, a video to show here. I don't know if it'll have sound, but. That's just a, a little clip of the experience. I wish I could get more on film of what it's like, um, of how they interact. And it, it's just got me thinking about what if we interacted like that with the natural world everywhere? What would it be like? What would our experiences be like if we took care of <laughs> and created spaces where animals and, and other you know, living beings felt safe? What would our experiences be like in those spaces? Not just on this you know, little boardwalk that's by a bird sanctuary. So food for thought there. It's a question I'm asking. And just putting this, this quote in, because there's a, a book that maybe some of you have, have heard about or even read um, that is relatively recent. I think it's just come out in the past year or two called Natural Curiosity Second Edition. And it's a resource for educators, the importance of indigenous perspectives in children's environmental inquiry. So it presents a inquiry-based learning approach and it side by side has a you know, Western perspective and then an, an indigenous perspective of how to facilitate um, inquiry-based learning. And there's quotes in there that I just found really um, valuable and important for me in my work. And it again brings us back to this idea of reciprocity. So indigenous cultures place great value on reciprocity. This value is expressed through cultural practices of giving when we need to receive something. So again, going back to that giving before taking. And the way to reweave community with the human and wider natural world is simple, if not always immediately practical, considering our current context, spend more time with them. So again, that sort of proximity and time piece is coming into that as well. So I think I'm gonna hand it over to Lander now if you're ready. Yes. So, okay. Are you on the next slide, Kayla? I am, yeah. Awesome, thanks. So I think I'll just start out um, by saying that again, that I work for a land trust after graduation. That was the, the job that I picked up doing outreach and programming. And for a long time, um, really forever, I think in the history of land trusts, at least in the US, the idea of preservation or conservation is, is definitely different than um, having a relationship with it. Um, or it is, it's one type of relationship, but maybe not as deep as, as we want to go. Um, and I know that there are a lot of land trusts in Maine who are trying to redefine what their definition is of stewardship. And instead of um, maybe preserving it and setting the land aside with just one trail through it um, and kind of it almost in an act of, of othering that land apart from ourselves, um, looking at it as what were the traditional ecological relationships with this land and how could we invite those to come back and actually have a give and take relationship as Kaylin was talking about with this piece of land and not just a trail for recreation through it. So that's something that um, we're working on as a land trust and others are as well. This slide also shows the honorable harvest and I'm just gonna let you read it yourself. And it's something that um, I think both Keelan and I are using in our programs with kids and our nature programming. And it's a, it's a lot and um, it's interesting as an adult now, I, I find myself asking myself many times, how, how do I actually do this and how do I do it authentically and it's, it'll probably take my whole life to to really do it well um, but I, I do find that children are very good at this um, and really don't have to really even be asked to 
to thank a tree or um, when they're harvesting pine needles, they, they almost intuitively know how to do it. Um, so that's been a really cool thing to experience, especially with the early childhood kids. So I think um, at this point, we've gotten about halfway through our presentation and we wanted to offer you the chance to put a note in the chat box, um, maybe about what reciprocity means to you at this point in time. Um, and it's, it, if it's very new, that's okay too. And um, if you have anything you might wanna share about how you potentially have participated in the honorable harvest or in a reciprocal relationship with the outdoors. So you can just add little notes to the chat box. All right, I got lost in the slides, it skipped ahead. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> And this might be something that people want to think on as well. It's okay if you don't have an answer right away. We're going to provide some time at the end of our slideshow to go into breakout rooms and you'll get a chance to revisit this question as well. So you can Linda, be we, sorry to interrupt. Could you say the question one more time? I got distracted. I was trying to follow the slides as they went. Yeah. Um, so the question is, um, maybe what does reciprocity mean to you at this time? Have you participated in any acts of the honorable harvest of that reciprocal relationship? And if so, what might they be? Or how might you want to do it in the future? And those can, are very big I, questions. Yeah, and maybe I can just jump in with a quick e example where even today, um, I, there's wild strawberries that are coming out. And I looked around and I was like, oh, there's only one red strawberry. <laughs> Should I take it? Should I not? I really want to taste it. And um, refrained from it in that patch, but then found another patch where there were a bunch and it felt like it was okay. And I sort of checked in and said like, is it okay? And I even said the words out loud, is it okay if I have one? And um, felt in myself that it was all right to taste it. And I chose one and, and tasted it and then said, thank you after I've eaten it and said it was delicious. So that's just one example. All right, I think we can go on to the next. Oh, it looks like we've got one person in the chat box here. Intimate relationship with Mother Earth, listening to nature. Yes, absolutely. Songs, lots of singing and songs to thank the land, animals, plants that we have received something from. Yes, absolutely. I was just putting, today I was putting together with a friend a video about the white pine tree, which is in celebration of the white, white pine tree, and we had a song that we sung to the tree. So that is a, is a fun way. All right, you can keep adding them, and but we'll move on. So this next slide, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some ways that com community in where I live are kind of showing up to build that, rebuild that reciprocal relationship. And it's, it's kind of all mixed in with the honorable harvest and just that broader definition of reciprocity. This first picture um, is of a fertility butterfly on oxeye daisies. And there are a lot of people showing up in our community um, who are interested in, in ethical mowing practices. And so learning that um, there are a lot of creatures and birds and animals um, and insects who really need the meadows. And so it's best not to mow until November. And you can do this as a very small homeowner or renter with a small backyard, or, and you can also do it as a big agricultural farmer. Um, and if you're a farmer, that like the harvest of the hay, if you do it later in the season, you, you kind of allow like the ground nesting birds to have their time and the, the migrating birds to come and eat their food. Um, and yeah, it just kind of allows for a give and take in this meadow space. Um, and then the second picture is of bluebird eggs. And we have something on the peninsula called the Bluebird Trail. And that is um, a, just a bunch of bird boxes in various fields, some on private owned land, some on more like public spaces. And people monitor them and, and help create the, um, the nest box with a little pod inside of it. And so I think it's 
it's this idea that, that the bluebirds are, are eating insects and, and helping maintain a really healthy ecosystem for us. And they're also so beautiful and we love seeing them and that we're able to kind of return a little bit of something to them by helping them have a safe home. And then this last picture, it's kind of hard to see, but all the texture in the water um, are fish. They're alewives um, that make their migration from the sea up to the ponds um, through the streams in, during pretty much the whole month of May. And there's a very rich cultural heritage with alewives in this area and in a lot of places along the coast. Um, and a lot of people eat them and use them for bait. And in the past probably five, 10 years, there's been a lot of efforts to remove dams so that the alewives can actually return to the pond because the dams were blocking them before. Um, and these, these fish have been a part of the indigenous people's lives for millennia and are a part of Mainers' lives as well. Um, and so they're, they're kind of looked at as like everybody's lunch and also as like a connector between sea and land. Um, so very, very important species. And so this is a, rebuilding the fish ladders as a way to kind of help them out and participate in that reciprocity. Um, all right, and then we have a quote here, another from Robin Wall Kimmerer. We need acts of restoration, not only for polluted waters and degraded lands, but also for our relationship to the world. We need to restore honor to the way we live so that when we walk through the world, we don't have to revert our eyes with shame, so that we can hold our heads up high and receive the respectful acknowledgement of the rest of the earth's beings. I just really love that, so I stuck that in there. All right, so this is our um, impact form, which kind of got this whole webinar started in the first place. Kaylin, maybe I'll let you start and then I'll chime in as we move through it. Yeah, yeah, so um, just a little, we're gonna show you a form, which is a tool that can be used because sometimes it can feel like, where do I even start with, with even considering my ecological relationships? And um, you know, for some of us, it might be easier than others. And this whole process of understanding how we interact with our, our, the places, particularly for programs, came about through an introduction of a, an ecological impact assessment. So this was, I, I lived in England for five years and I actually did forest school training while I lived there. Um, forest school is a, you know, becoming more and more widespread in the UK context and they have qualifications. And um, as part of that, when you're running a program, you complete an ecological impact assessment. And that's a form where you sort of do an inventory of the species that are in your site. You come up with a mitigation plan for, you know, what is the, is the potential impact of your program? Are you going to be digging? Um, are you going to be having a fire? Are you going to be walking around trampling particular areas? And how are you going to mitigate, mitigate those impacts? And then I moved back to North America. Um, and started to work with an organization based in Canada that had also started with that impact assessment form, but then had adapted it and had gotten some, uh, some advice from indigenous um, people to adapt the form to sort of include an indigenous perspective. So to have a, a way of thinking about it that, um, yeah, included more about in indigenous people and the, the relationships to the land in that way it was still called an ecological impact assessment form. And as Lander and I continued to work with it, for me, I felt like ecological impact didn't cut it. <laughs> it felt too like, we're just thinking about, we're just gonna do this stuff and then we're just gonna consider what the impact is. Um, and for me, I wanted to take a step back and think about, no, what is the relationship? Kind of bringing in that, that piece first, what is the relationships and also considering our impact. So I feel like this is a, a form that is evolving over time <laughs> and it's still not at where it's probably gonna be in, who knows, you know, months time, a year's time, 10 years time. But we wanted to just show you, so I'm gonna switch my screen up a little bit so I can show you um, the template. And we're not gonna go super into it, but uh, just to give you a, a bit of an idea. Can everybody see that? Is that showing up? Cool. So yeah, this is an adaptation of these, these forms from England and also from you know, Canada and then with Landers and my twist of it, um, to it. And it's just prompts, I suppose. This isn't something that's like a tick list for you to be like, yep, I got to do this and this and this. There, it's more of prompts of things that you could think about for the place where you're working. So thinking about you know, the name of the site, the location, who's responsible for the land, 
um, including contact details, having a site map so you can have a better understanding of, of where things are in relation to each other. Um, we put a space to include photos of the site. This is something that we could also share with other people. So it was a way for them to build a little bit more of an understanding of what we were doing and where we were. And this was definitely something that was added once moving back to North America, but an acknowledgement of the traditional land and territory. So this is really bringing in, okay, let's, you know, rather than just thinking about us right now at this place, let's think a little bit more about the human relationship, relationship to this place that has been a part of that for, you know, millennia. Um, so really digging in and doing some research, who were the indigenous people that, that lived and live here? You know, they still live <laughs> in these places. Um, are there treaties that are based on this site? Um, treaties that often aren't upheld. So having an acknowledgement that, you know, there was a treaty signed here, potentially, some places there aren't, and what's being upheld and what's not. Um, languages. Language is so important in understanding um, places. So um, thinking about that and then also the meanings behind that, because often names come with a meaning. We name it for a reason because it means something to us. Um, and then also some consideration on who could you start building reciprocal relationships with? Uh, are there individuals or organizations that are open to that? And that's a whole nother, whole nother topic to discuss about how to build relationships with indigenous communities and to do so in a respectful way, but something to, to consider. Lander, did you wanna add anything before moving through it? I think um, just, just one thing in, in reflecting on filling this form out myself when I started Forest Day programs a year ago now. Um, I, I filled most of it out, but this section in particular, the acknowledgement of traditional land and territories, I found um, that I was only able to fill parts of it in at a time. And so I think that's, that's something to remember that, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're starting a program and you're trying to fill this all in, that it can be done um, th throughout a period of time. And that if it is done throughout a period of time, especially this box here, um, it kind of shows that that you're you're participating in that relationship building, and it's not just a plucking of information that you plop right in. So that's important to consider, I guess. Great, thanks. Yeah, and then also a consideration for other other community members that have an attachment to or a connection with that place, and how are we going to uh, to accommodate for that? Um, we may not be the only ones there, so who do we need to? build relationships with, you know, to make sure that we're, we're all looking after the, the place and being respectful of each other. And then considering the, you know, the physical geographical features of the land and while also learning about that, thinking about what the traditional names of local landmarks were and are too, because when North America was colonized, all the names were changed. And there still are names that are, you know, exist. And so can we respectfully bring those back to back to life and acknowledge them. Um, and then just think about, you know, bigger picture, bigger scale, like what climate zone are we in? What is the biome? Um, what are the natural communities that live here? The local watersheds and tributaries, water really influences the land, like huge impact on um, our, you know, tiny little spaces that we may operate in are so impacted by where water is in the wider landscape. So having that understanding can really connect us um, to the bigger picture. And then thinking about the natural and built features of the, of the land, um, you know, we were, we're part of the land and as we build our houses and our schools and our roads and all of that, that's also contributing to the ge geography. So, um, you know, hills, valleys, creeks, marshes, concrete, bridges, buildings, what are all the things that are contributing to the, the features of where, where we are? Um, and I touched on the traditional names of local landmarks and, and meanings. And Lander, feel free to jump in if there's things that you want to add. I'm just kind of breezing through. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then kind of getting, so that's sort of the bigger picture pieces and then moving a little bit smaller to in your particular place. These are just, again, some prompts of different community members that, that are part of the ecology to consider the trees and the plants. And um, Lander and I had a little conversation here about whether to call it understory flowering plants <laughs> or trees and, and um, the idea that it really depends on the audience that's using this form and how specific we want to get, but because technically trees are plants <laughs> uh, and so are ferns. Um, but then also considering fungi and, and moss and lichen and the birds and the mammals, the insects, and then considering are there species here within all of that that are at risk? Are there species that are native? Are there species that are introduced? 
And then there's a, a phrase that's often used of invasive species. And this is something that Lander and I have had lots of conversations about because invasive um, has a, a perspective around it of this is something that's here that shouldn't be here. And it sort of demonizes the, the plant or the animal as like, we need to kill it, we need to get rid of it, when really it was humans who brought it. <laughs> and then we're punishing the animal or the plant for, for being there as an invader. You know, there's, so there's, yeah, just a, a whole, whole wide range of thinking about it. And so I have felt uncomfortable with calling it an invasive species. Um, and so we found in a, a article that's referenced at the, in the footnote at the bottom here, um, that's, called Muskrat Theories, Tobacco in the Streets and Living Chicago as Indigenous Land in um, part of environmental education research, where they phrased invasive species as species that humans have lost their relationship with. And I just thought that was a different way to think about it. So that's something that we're playing with, you know, in our thinking around this. Um, and then also just identifying for our own awareness, are there species that are poisonous that we need to be knowledgeable about, things that are edible that we can interact with and, you know, with children as well, for them to learn what is, what is safe and edible. And then also considering are there water sources nearby, um, what is the soil like, because the soil dictates what lives there in a lot of ways, um, as well as the bedrock and the surface rock. It sort of all starts, starts there as to what can live um, in that place. Lander, did you have anything to, to add? No, I think that's good. I think you're covering it well. Okay, great. Yeah, and then considering the, the historical uses of the, of the land in the past, um, I have experience of you know, a connection with a, a forest school program that set themselves up, got themselves running. They've been running for a few years. They run fantastic programs and discovered down the line that they were operating this program on a sacred ceremonial place for the indigenous, the, the local indigenous community who had actually been restricted access however many years before. And so they had gone in, you know, built this four school program without ever really knowing that it was such an important indigenous um, historical site. So if we can, and that can cause damaging uh, or damage to relationships if you're trying to build them with indigenous people. So we can't do everything perfect. Um, and I think it, sometimes things happen and acknowledging, acknowledging <laughs> what has happened is really important to repair those relationships. But if it's something that we can think about first, maybe we can avoid those, that potential for, for harm um, to continue. So yeah, um, and then finally, this is where you, you, we get more into the direct actions that we can, we can take within our programs and considering what are the activities or experiences that we're going to be doing and how they're going to be impacting um, the place. But we've slotted in here before considering the, you know, the impacts and the mitigation to start, to start with relationship and reciprocity. So before going into, yep, these are the things that we're going to do and what the children are going to enjoy. And then these are the ways that we can, you know, try to minimize the impact to first, first go to how are we going to be reciprocal with this land? What are we going to give before we take? Really hard question. <laughs> really hard question. And that's part, part of why we put it in there. Um, because, it, yeah, you tend to, or I tend to be like, well, I don't even know. I don't even know where to start. So you move on. Um, but by putting it in there, it's like a prompt to be like, yeah, think about this first and see what, see what comes to mind. And I think Lander's already given some really great examples of ways to, to reciprocate. Um, yeah, and then considering the, the impacts of your interactions on all the different layers of the, the ecological community, the ground, the field, the understory, the canopy, and then our actions for how we can try to reduce those impacts. Um, so that is a, a summary of this form, which we will provide a, a template with to people who, who are attending or, or watching this recording so that you can use it, um, adapt it, um, let it inspire you in whatever way feels good. Um, yeah. So anything to add before I move back to the slideshow? I think that's good. Okay. Um, I am conscious that we're definitely running. Maybe we'll, uh, Lander will save the breakout rooms to, or, or maybe the discussion questions that we had till the very end um, for the people who want to stay on a little bit later. Does that work? So, 
So Lander, I'll let you jump into your stories here and we'll save the discussion piece till after. Oh, you're muted, Lander. So oh, sorry. Yes, sounds good. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is a picture um, of a baby spruce tree and it has quite the little story behind it of young children taking care of the forest that I wanted to share with you. So in the fall, um, last fall, I started working with a first or a kindergarten and a first grade class um, at a small local elementary school. And they, on our first day out in the woods, so we go out every single week to this spot. And they had previously gone out with a Montessori teacher. And so had kind of known this space as well from that time. And the first day that we went out, um, they noticed that this baby spruce tree had completely fallen over, although it wasn't completely severed from the ground. And they immediately rushed into the story of how when they were in pre-K, they would come out here and sing songs around the little tree and how devastated they were that they had, had seen it fall into the ground on their first day out with me at Forest Days. And so we did a lot of brainstorming and work around how to help this little tree. And it was really all led by them, um, propping it up with sticks and with string, um, with sand that they had found and rocks. And I just, I found it so amazing that this, this kind of childhood knowing of, of how to take care of other living things um, just re really shown through in this instance. And there, there's even a picture, it hadn't snowed yet, but it was winter time and um, they, would, they would decorate the tree at Christmas time and um, around Valentine's Day, um, they, put, they put little heart cakes around the tree and it just kind of became the center of this space for us. And when they were, one little boy, when he was in the process of propping the tree up, um, I overheard him and he wasn't talking to his peers or to me, but I overheard him talking to the little tree and he said, um, don't worry, little guy, we'll have you feeling better by dinner time. And I just, my heart just melted and I just felt like that is such an incredible, incredible thing. And I think oftentimes in our really busy culture, it would, it, it would be considered just like, oh, that's just like a child just talking, like it doesn't matter a whole lot. But if it, it, I had a moment of pause where I thought if we all approach the world this way, that so much on the earth would be fixed by dinner time. Um, so I just wanted to share that as a story and a quote as well that relates to this from um, the natural curiosity book that Keelan shared earlier. If given the chance, children will show us how our spirits can both nurture and be nurtured by our place. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is a, a quick little story I wanted to share with you. You're probably wondering what this is you see in front of you. It's a, a story from my own childhood. When I was in fifth and sixth grade, I loved making mud balls, like to a pretty extreme extent. My friend and I um, would spend all of recess collecting mud and forming it into little balls. And as I was reflecting on this experience that was over the course of several years, and I was kind of an older child as well, being in fifth and sixth grade, I realized that it really helped deepen my ecological relationship with this place, the schoolyard and this place that I live in, because I learned so much along the way. We started out with just a ball of mud, but we then um, found that worm castings out in the soccer field was this amazing rich dirt that we would pile on as a layer and kind of smush down. And we found that rolling the mud balls down a grassy knoll with a little bit of wet mud on it made this beautiful weaving of grass that made another solid layer. And we found that the balsam trees had these sap bubbles that you could pop and smear sap you can see in the picture here. And it almost made it like this beautiful, shiny, waterproof layer. And we found that if you ground mussel shells into a powder, they would make this beautiful sparkly layer. And just on and on, so many layers of our landscape that we put into these, into these mud balls. Um, so I think a kind of key takeaways here are just like the layering of the ecological relationship over time that can happen. And that I think it's pretty essential for free play and exploration to be a part of building that ecological relationship. And that's, that's what we were doing. And we were, we were going against a lot of um, kind of conformity as, as well. And it was, it was almost, a, in some ways, looking back, an act of social resistance as well, kind of a resistance to growing up and resistance to a popular culture um, where our peers were listening to popular music and wearing bell bottoms and going to the mall. And um, my friend and I were like, no, this, this is what we want to be doing. And 
and we're going to do it even if it looks weird. Um, so let's see. Is there anything else I wanted to say about that? Yeah, so I think it's mostly just, I feel like a, a good example of um, the, the time piece, um, spending a lot of time outdoors, the proximity as well of just finding what we had in our natural landscapes to create these things. Um, and then the reciprocity piece, something I didn't mention was that we didn't consider them just random mud balls. We actually considered them our mud ball babies. And we named them and we made them things and they had sleepovers with each other. And it was this whole world that we created, which to a lot of people might sound kind of weird, but to us it was absolutely amazing. And I think even though it maybe wasn't like the first idea of reciprocity or care for the natural world that you might think, it was us practicing that. Um, and it was also, uh, for like for example, we would make them um, uh, snowsuits out of beeswax that we stole from the art room so that we could take them out in the wintertime and play with them in the snow. And so it was also this um, kind of time of invention and creativity that um, just kind of overlapped with all of these other things we're talking about. Okay, uh, next slide. All right. Um, so that's kind of my non-traditional story of building an ecological relationship. And I wanted to follow up with a few other ways that, that you could do it that might be a little more, a little more traditional. Um, I've recently heard of people having plant allies. So choosing a plant that maybe pops up in your backyard right in the midst of your life and wants to be there for some reason and really get to know it. And it could just, it could be the common dandelion or it could be something else, um, but get to know it on all the different levels you can think of, um, tasting it and hanging out with it and watching it through the seasons. There's also, of course, the sit spot, which is a wonderful place to return to over and over again to build that connection. Daily walks, I feel like it's how I learned a lot of my naturalist knowledge, just going on the same walk over and over again. Um, also journaling, if, if you're into that, can be a wonderful way to, to process what you're finding and seeing. And I think um, one of the takeaways of this as well is just that it takes time, I think, to build an ecological relationship. And it's not just like one yearly cycle, but it's really our whole lives. And I think that that maybe is hard for some of us to hear because in modern Western culture, we generally have been trained to want things and get them really fast. Um, but if you think of traditional ecological knowledge in indigenous community groups and how they've built this over thousands and thousands of years, um, we definitely have to be, be patient as we build the relationship. And then um, it looks like we have one minute left. So I think I'll just say with this one, um, oh, sorry, Kaylin. Oh yeah, you, you moved it, awesome. I'm like reading from my notes on one side. All right, so I just wanted to say, going back to our inventory form or to our assessment form, um, that one way of kind of bringing it full circle and maybe you've made your list of, of plants and animal species and edible species is to gather your group of students and create a story out of your experiences on the land. So, and using, um, the, the plants and the animals that you've recorded as, as the characters and using the weather that you've experienced as part of the setting and as your setting, this is part of our setting, the, the river, um, as the backdrop and um, creating a map and creating a story and um, kind of bringing it full circle in that way, I think could be powerful and get it out of the form as well. And I think that's, that's it. Thank yeah. you. So Landa and I did a run through of this and we were like, oh, we'll only take half an hour. And then, but we did say like, it'll probably be a little longer because we'll get into our stories. And sure enough, we did. <laughs> so we had planned to do some breakout rooms, um, but I'm just conscious of people's time, but we'll just place these questions here. And for anybody who wants to stick around and keep chatting, maybe these are, are conversation prompts, um, or you can just take these with you and think about them later. But thinking, what, what do we want to know more about our places and what are steps that we can take to work towards that? And then how can we involve the children that we work with in learning a deeper story of the land with us? So we don't have to fill out that ecological impact assessment, you know, relationship and impact assessment form first and then just hide it away of like, okay, we did that. How can we involve children in the process of learning about, about the place? And also how can we learn from the children too? 
Um, and then again, coming back to that question of what does reciprocity with the land mean for us? You know, Lander and I have given some examples for ourselves, but it's a really individual personal thing. So taking time to consider that for yourself, if you would like. Um, and then how do you embed that, like tangibly, how do you embed that into programs? Um, so these are just questions to, to consider. We can circle back to them for anybody who, who sticks around. So bef yeah, but it, just quickly, while those uh, who do need to go <laughs> um, soon, we just wanted to let you know that there are some free resources available to continue learning about these things and also follow Landers and, and my personal journeys. This is a list of blog posts that we've written that relate to this topic. And so you can sort of see where our heads have been at and, and connected with the stories of us working with children too. So um, that will, this slideshow and the, all the hyperlinks will be, I think, sent to, to everybody or made available. So you can return to these if you want to. Um, Lander has also put together um, some resources, which Liza has done a beautiful job of embedding into um, the Inside Outside website. So that's now up to, to think about land and race and equity. Um, some resources for us to dive into that a little bit more and, and figure out how we can work towards um, equity in the work that we do, particularly with the with the land. Um, there's so much inequity um, in in this work as well as you know across the the, the nation and, and beyond. So um, that's at the the Inside Outside website. You can uh, take a look at even more resources. And then I just wanted to, to let you know, as you know, the creator of, of Forest Schools, I'm really concentrating now on providing resources and support for educators to, to learn. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm learning. <laughs> and so I'm creating ways for us to, to learn together um, by designing, you know, right now it's online workshops and professional learning communities. And um, I have a, a newly launched learning platform at forestschools.codia.com. And these are just a couple events that are, that are coming up in July that I'm inviting people to come to. These two are free. I have a couple of workshops and things that have a fee, um, but these two are, are free to, if you wanna grow your network. I've lived in lots of different places, so you're welcome to join some Zoom calls where we can talk to people from all over the world. And then I've also just um, decided to form this professional learning community around facing colonization in our work with the land because it's a, it's a journey that I've in, been embarking on for a while now and have, I think there's a lot of individual learning to be done for sure, but I see value in coming together to, in a you know, safe place where we can talk to each other about it too and share thoughts and ideas because it, it can feel paralyzing to not know what to do <laughs> or how to approach this topic. Um, so this is just an offering for those who might want to, to do that, to dive deeper. Um, yeah, and Lander and I are, are available for people who want to, to get in touch. So this is our, our contact details, um, our websites, and you're welcome to, to reach out to us if you have questions or thoughts or just want to connect. And I think that's, that's it for the slideshow. So thank you so much, Keila and Lander. This was really, really wonderful. And I was reflecting on where we started with this, which I think was a conversation ages ago about the the, the document that you shared and oh my gosh this is amazing you came up with so much to share um, so I'm really grateful and people are saying thank you as well um, and I wanted to offer if people want to stay on we could continue the conversation or um, work to answer some of those questions and do some reflecting in breakout rooms um, so maybe we'll just give for people who are, are needing to leave, we'll give a, a couple minutes um, for people to do that. And then those of us who are still here, and there was a question, I don't know, I'm killing it was while you were talking, um, Lander answered one of the questions, but, oh, Paula, Paula had asked is the information and is this information and ecological relationship information in your book? Um, the, like the, the form, it, I talk about it, I mention it, but in terms of the, like the impact, um, relationship and impact form, that's going to, that'll, that'll be my next book. <laughs> that, that sort of process has occurred simultaneously to the publishing. And so it didn't get into this, this book, um, in that form, but I certainly start to touch on it and, and tell stories, um, about, yeah, relationships with the land as opposed to just in the land, um, or in these places in the book. So more to come on that. All right. 
So those folks who are still here, um, I, can't, I can't see you all, but I'm just gonna go ahead and assume that you're wanting to be a part of, the, um, of continuing the conversation. And actually there are, there are just five of us. So um, Kathy, I don't know if you're able or interested in turning your video on and joining the, the conversation that way. Oh, okay, just kidding. I see, I just saw your note. Thank you I for staying for a little bit. What's that? I said I could stay on for a little bit. Okay. And you're in Arizona? Correct. Okay. Um, Kaylin, are you, I don't know if you want to facilitate or put the slide back up that had the questions. Sure, I can do that. Um, or actually, well, I could just say the questions if that's easier. Sure. Then, because I can't see everybody in. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. A bit of a struggle. Um, but I've lost the. Where did the slides go? <laughs> um, Aylin, do you want me to put the questions up? Do you have them? My slide. The slides disappeared. I must have X'd out of it. I do. Or maybe I if you put them in the chat box. Yeah. Then we, everyone can read them and still see everyone. That's my plan. Awesome. Thanks, Lander. Absolutely. So, Kathy, while they're working on that, I'm curious how you found us. Um, actually, Instagram, I think. Um, I was just following a bunch of different forest schools and stuff, and I think I, I think your page came up, forest school came up, and so, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so, sorry, it's, it's actually not letting me copy and paste into the chat <laughs> box. So, no. We have to read them. Yeah, yeah. It was what. What do we want to know more about our places, and what steps can we start to to take to work towards that? Um, that was the first question, and then the other one was how do we involve children, and then the third one was what does reciprocity look like? So those are sort of three different directions that we could, and overlapping um, ways that we could take the conversation. If anyone has any thoughts. I mean, I love just go the first question. How do like what do we want to know more about our place? I think, oh, yeah, holding that question every time you go out the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I can find I find it sometimes a little hard because I've moved so much in my life, so I sort of come from this perspective of starting over, and I've I've lived in such diverse places too that it does feel like starting over. Like I grew up in a tropical place, then I moved to. A